Welcome, everyone. I'm Jeremy Siegel, the co-host of Morning Edition at GBH, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this month's Beyond the Page with Wicked's Gregory Maguire. In a few minutes, we'll be joined by Gregory Maguire, the American fantasy novelist best known for his first adult novel, Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West, later adapted into the record-setting hit musical, Wicked. Gregory has written several dozen crossover books for adults and for children's, including Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister, Mirror Mirror, and After Alice. Gregory comes to us just from creating the world of Cress Watercress, a lavishly illustrated woodland tale with the classic sensibility and a modern flair. And before I welcome Gregory on screen, I wanted to explain how this evening's event is going to work, because we are using Zoom webinar. As our audience, we cannot see or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions during the course of this conversation by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. Again, that's the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen where you can type in questions. You can put your questions in at any point in time during our conversation this evening, and we'll do our best to address as many of them as we can throughout the night. See a question or two that you want to hear the answer to, you're able to vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab, and we'll be able to see the most popular questions that will rise to the top of our list. To activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, you can select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen and select the live transcript. Two transcription display options are going to pop up if you do that we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript, which is a sidebar window that'll open where you can see what each speaker is saying. And please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed, so bear with us with that. And now that housekeeping is done, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Gregory McGuire. And here I am. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining all of us tonight, Gregory. And as I mentioned, we're going to be getting to audience questions. I'm sure there are so many of them. But first off, I was just hoping that you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your new work, Crest Watercress, um, which is just a beautiful book with beautiful illustrations and beautiful writing. Tell us a little bit about how it came to be. Sure. Uh, it is an animal story. It's, uh, I suppose, descended from the traditions of Aesop and La Fontaine, especially as they were affected by the great popularity of things like The Wind in the Willows and the Beatrix Potter books. I mean, there's a whole world of talking animals out there and always has been. But children seem to me to be particularly attuned to that possibility. Most of us know that our dogs have thoughts. And most of us know that our cats have thoughts and they're not very flattering about us. <laughs> but children know that all animals are creatures and that all animals have individual um, character traits. Uh, they know this instinctively just by the brightness in the eyes of an animal. So I decided that I, eventually I decided that I wanted to write a story I didn't really think it was going to be about animals. I had, I had a more subterranean intention initially. I was driving back from a conference about four years ago uh, down, down the interstate, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. And I had met an artist there who did really spectacular pictures of animals uh, in picture books. And I said, if I ever wrote a picture book with, with fairy animals in it, believe me, you'd be my guy. And, uh, and he said, well, why don't you try? And I said, because I don't, I don't really do that kind of thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that, I'm not that kind of fellow. Um, but, uh, but as I, as I continued driving, I, my mind went on a different track, and I started thinking about a young person I knew who was having a, a sort of a hard uh, year. This person was at the end of high school, and had this person been a different kind of student, I might have gone to the public library or my local bookstore and tried to find something that I thought might offer some consolation, some challenge, maybe a couple of handholds, but at any rate, a, a letter from the beyond that said, uh, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. This is something 
that you might feel alone about, but you're not alone. But this child's not a reader. So I was kind of a stop. That's the only professional skill I have is to read books and talk about them or write them. Uh, so I, I kept on and thought, I can't do anything. I, you know, that's not gonna work. That, that's a fruitless ambition. And I began to think if I could only go back 10 years and have found a book then that I could that I could have read to this child had I had the opportunity, what would I have wanted that book to say? What is it? Which book would I pick? And I couldn't think of any book on my shelf that was going to do what I wanted a certain book to do, which was to suggest to readers of all ages, because my books are for all ages, but especially to readers of sort of middle middle school. By that I mean older than Frog and Toad, but younger than Lolita, you know, just somewhere, somewhere <laughs> in that in that big middle ground. Uh, and I wanted to be able to say to uh, a child, life is a lot more complicated than we're telling you. Life has a lot more variations of mood and a lot more complexities of syntheses of mood. It's not just one mood after another. Sometimes moods collide. Sometimes they happen at the same time. Sometimes you think you've recovered from a bad day only to find out, you know, next Thursday it has returned and it's even worse. And, and I thought, this is, this is what I don't see in my own library, expansive library and reading memory. I don't see a book that says the secret to surviving emotional travail is to recognizing that there are time systems involved and there are emotional life has a biorhythm. It's not just, you know, mommy, will I have a friend when I go to kindergarten? Well, honey, you know, with a face like yours, I doubt it, you know, but let's go to the library and see whether I can find a book. Will I have a friend? And, you know, books can sometimes address a question once, but there was nothing that I could see that said, really what you need to know is that there are calendars involved and there are repetitions of, of emotional uh, situation involved. And if you can grasp onto that, you have, you have a real tool to work with. You have a real tool for the rest of your life to work with. This is something that I think books for children, even though I admire many, many, many of them, don't tend to say. And so I thought, I wish I, I wish I could have written a book like that 10 years ago to read to this child. And then suddenly I remembered, oh, fairy animals, fairy <laughs> animals, fairy animals have moods. Every child knows that. And so I sat down to write a picture book and it became a 240 page chapter book for an older audience, but still for an audience that I think would be, um, would welcome a story that's both funny and uh, adventurous but also pays attention to the nuances and ambiguities and contradictions of the weird emotional life we all have to find ourselves living. Mm -hmm. And for anybody um, listening and watching who hasn't had a chance to read the book yet, which they should, um, it deals with a young rabbit who's, um, who has lost her father and goes on a, an adventure essentially with her mother um, and, and sibling. And I don't wanna give much away beyond that, except that a lot of it deals with fear um, and the fear that young children experience and the way they find some things scary and they don't find other things scary and some things exciting. Um, there's one line that stuck out to me in your writing where you asked as the author how to manage being scared. And I'm curious, like what made you, you know, think about dealing with fear when you're when you're talking about kids and how much your own fears play into your writing with something like this? Well, <laughs> we, we all, any of us who are professional writers know that we really only have one bank account and it's our own childhood. And with luck, we don't withdraw everything out of it before we're dead uh, because we keep going back to the bank and making other withdrawals. Uh, I don't know any, any grown up who didn't live with fear in childhood uh, one way or another. Sometimes it's a fear of something little like is my, is my Lego pirate gonna go down the bathtub? Well, yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> is it ever going to come back? No, it's not. <laughs> and but the fears are also are also much vaster if you've had any kind of trauma in life, and many many children do and 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 will have trauma uh, eventually. None of us are excused from that uh, from the reward of hard living that you know it's called trauma. Uh, and so I thought 
fear is, it's only one thing, but it's pretty constant. You know, uh, anxiety and fear are not the same thing as depression and they're not the same thing as joy and they're not the same thing as loneliness. They, 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 have, a, they have a kind of a, a, certain, a certain ugly and recognizable stink and children know what that feels like even long before they have any words to articulate the fact that that's actually a condition that they sometimes live in and that they sometimes escape from. We hope that you always escape from it. But. <laughs> so you mentioned that you were thinking about going subterranean with writing this book. We have one viewer who wrote in with a question, why is Cress a rabbit? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I, have a, uh, I have three kids. They're, they're now mostly grown. Uh, <laughs> but I, I didn't know the answer to this question when I was asked it by a, a TV interviewer about two months ago. And I, I said kind of jokingly, well, you know, I don't know. I I've actually don't know any rabbits. In fact, I don't know many animals because I have a fairly active uh, system of allergic responses to animal fur. So I've never had pets and I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a natural as uh, you know, on the farm, let's say. Uh, but, they, and, and, the, and this interviewer said, well, you know, but why a rabbit? And I said, I don't, I don't know, I've never met any. Then I said, oh, yes, I have. I did meet a rabbit once. About 12 years ago, I took my kids to visit some friends in Geneva, Switzerland. We drove through France and went to Geneva. And when we got there, my host said, oh, you know, my kids are in the backyard. They're, they're feeding the rabbit. Um, my three kids pelted out of the car and I pummeled down the alleyway and turned the corner of the house in Geneva and raced up to the rabbit hutch thunderingly because they'd been in the car for four hours and really needed to run. And the rabbit took one look at them coming upon him down the fairway and fell over and died. Just, mm. that was it, gone, dead, kaput. So my children's first experience with a rabbit was with a dead rabbit that they had just killed. So what, what does that tell us? About, about rabbits, well, they can be scared. And also they don't have many natural defenses. They have only two defenses that I know of. They can run fast when they're not penned up in a hutch and they breed fast. Those are their two defenses. Um, so this poor rabbit died of a heart attack and that was a great start to my, my children's experience in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rabbit murderers. But I thought about rabbits and different kinds of animals. And I thought rabbits are particularly vulnerable, aren't they? I mean, they're sweet, but they really, you know, they don't fly. They, they, they burrow a little bit, but kind of half-heartedly, you know, they, they're, they're very tame. They, mm -hmm. We have rabbits here in, in my backyard and they come out and they look at me and I look at them and we both go about our business. You know, if I start to run at them, they disappear. <laughs> they're, they're kind of, um, but I would never do that. <laughs> uh, but they're, uh, you know, they're, they're just, uh, you know, they're like children. You just have to, you just have to protect them. If, you know, even if you have a, even if you have Mr. McGregor's vegetable garden, you know, you, <laughs> let the garden, you, you have to protect your rabbits, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, when I thought you were going to say, why did you, why did you start the story the way you did? Which is, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a sad first chapter as Cress and her mother are leaving the house. And I thought, well, how else could I have started it? And long after the book was in print, I thought I missed the opportunity for a different first line. And I should have begun the book. And I don't know whether this will uh, chime, uh, Jeremy, with uh, your own reading experience in life, but I, sh I could have started with, in a hole in the ground, there lived a rabbit you know, rather than a hobbit, but you know, <laughs> they're kind of sort of alike, aren't they? A hobbit is senseless too. A hobbit can't run very fast either. Um, so, so that's why a rabbit, that's a long, long winded answer to your question. We have several questions that are coming in about Wicked. I'm sure we'll also have several more coming in about Cress, um, but this, this feels like a good opener for some of those and that's how have you changed as an author since writing Wicked all the way to writing this new book? Well, Wicked, uh, I, I began to write Wicked roughly 30 years ago. So I've changed, uh, among other things, I've gotten old. Uh, but I have, I have developed more confidence in the fact that the stories that I want to tell are 
there's a, there's a, there's at least a chance that they're going to hit with a certain segment of the reading audience. When I wrote Wicked, I basically thought I'm writing for the kind of college kid I was uh, as a junior in college. Mm -hmm. And there are maybe 12 people in the United States who might still be like this. And so if though these 12 people could find Wicked, then I have found my little coterie of, of, of uh, devotees and that, that will be it for my life and you know, fine and good. I did not expect that Wicked would, would hit in any particular way, nor did I expect that it would sort of tweak the chromosome of popular culture the way that it's done. Nobody expected that, especially my agent, <laughs> who was kind of shocked when I got my first royalty check. Uh, the very first payment season, I, I called him up and I said, this is, um, I think there's a mistake. <laughs> did you do? I said, yes, I think there's an extra zero on the end of this check and possibly two. <laughs> And he said to me, I thought so too. <laughs> and I went and checked it. No, you know, this book is this book has hit or and is hitting. So what has that done to me though as a writer? Well, it's still taken quite a lot of time, but I've become more confident that if I find something that grips me so that I can't let it go in my own head that um, I can at least write it to my own satisfaction, whether I can sell it, I, I, you know, after, 45 years in print, I don't sell everything that I write. Sometimes I'll spend a year writing a book that uh, just doesn't, uh, doesn't appeal to my editors. And uh, I just say, okay, well, that was good experience. That was like going out and putting in the rain. You know, you don't really get anywhere, but you've had the experience of exercise and uh, come back on a sunny day. Uh, so it's given me confidence. And it has, I, I've also had to um, liberate myself from a certain kind of high anxiety about being considered uh, to be riding on everybody else's coattails. As you pointed out, Jeremy, a lot of my book books take inspiration from great works of the past. Even my books for adults are uh, springboarded often, not always, but often from the great works that consoled me as a child and that we, we recognize as a, as a culture. Uh, and so, I, got, I was very nervous about that at first. And I thought, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be pilloried and joked about as the grown up writer who rewrites children's books for grown ups. And then after about, you know, well, Wicked came out in 95 and I had my third adopted child by 2002. And, you know, it was like more important to pay the bills than to worry what I was thought of by, you know, the critics in the New York Review of Books. Uh, and also I, I, be, I began to be liberated saying, well, who cares? Who cares what I do? Work doesn't last that long anyway. Do what you love and affect people who read it now while you're alive and while they're alive to read it. And, you know, only Shakespeare lasts 500 years, you know, and, or Homer, you know, it's, it's like, don't, don't put yourself on a pedestal. Do what, you, do what you feel compelled to do. And so the success of Wicked, which gave me, you know, foundation upon which to stand, did liberate me to follow what my compulsions. David wrote in to ask, um, what first attracted you to the approach of retelling familiar stories and fairy tales, especially as adult stories? Well, I was a kid. I mean, like as, as we said at the beginning, and as a, as a kid, um, like most kids, especially I think kids who maybe didn't grow up in terribly prosperous circumstances, uh, I and my six brothers and sisters played with found materials. We didn't have a lot of money for even board games. You know, we had a library card and that was our main entertainment. And we had crayons and, and paper uh, and pencils and that's about it. Uh, but all kids play with found materials. Kids sitting on a stoop in a, in a hot city summer will find two stones and a penny and a stick and make a, a bouncing game or a, a game of hide and, and find. Uh, with what they have at hand. And so for me, what I had at hand to amuse myself was the stories that engaged me. Now, I should tell you, Jeremy, that my parents were, uh, were literary people. My father was a journalist in upstate New York. Uh, and my second mother, who raised me, uh, had been an English teacher and loved poetry and was a poet herself. And they thought very highly of the library as a civilizing influence. So 
what we did instead of getting toys, you know, heaps of toys for Christmas or, uh, you know, private ponies, or I kept asking every year for a personal valet for Christmas. I never got one. <laughs> uh, but what we got was the full access to the library and all the consolation and reward that the great writers of the ages have put on the shelves of children's libraries. We got L. Frank Baum in The Wizard of Oz. We got Alice in Wonderland. We got Narnia. Eventually we got Middle Earth and T.H. White's Once and Future King. We got all the picture books, Mario Sendak and Babar and Madeline and all the ones from the mid-century that, that most, uh, most Americans still recognize. Uh, and we also got the liberty to feel, hey, you know what? These are our stories. If we've read them, if we've taken them out of the library any number of times, if we can see our names on that old card that used to go in the you know, slot in the back of the book, we can see that we've taken out this book more than anybody else. We've taken it out six of the last 15 times, uh, then we own these stories. And so what I did was play with the stuff I had at hand like any artist starting out. If it's mud and a stick, you can draw pictures in the sand. And that's what I did. My, my mud was the books and the stories from the library and my stick was my imagination. Mm. Um, that makes me wonder sort of how early that imagination kicked in in a real way. Um, we had one listener who, who wrote in with a question along those lines saying, just the way you speak, I can tell you tell stories for a living, which I definitely can <laughs> hearing you speak too. Um, was this sense of storytelling just a natural talent for you? Was it something you felt immediately? It, it, it was. I began, um, I began writing stories when I was about five, five or six. And, but I began really uh, writing in order to have something at the bottom of the page uh, to ornament the pictures that I was drawing. I really, I started out life wanting to be an, an artist first. And it turned out that while I, I can draw and I've, I've done some uh, I've, I've done some artwork over, my, over the course of my life, uh, but I became much more uh, supple at uh, manipulating language than I could manipulating the lines that were gonna suggest which way a human hand went. You know, is mm -hmm. it that way or is it that way? It, you know, I, still have, I still have to think about it. Thumbs near your hips, thumbs near your hips. I have to think about it before I draw a hand uh, on, a, on a human arm. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to uh, remind people listening that if you want to ask Gregory McGuire anything, you can add your questions to the Q&A tab that is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions. You can also vote up um, people's questions if you like them, and those might be some of the ones that we get to first, including this one. Um, someone wrote in to ask, what authors are your biggest influences? What about favorites to read? Oh wow, that's a that's a that's yeah. a thing. I did I did mention just a, a minute or two ago T. H. White. Mm -hmm. When I got to the Once and Future King, uh, and I must have been about sixteen or seventeen or so, it was the end of high school, uh, which is the retelling of the Camelot saga, the, the King Arthur saga, uh, in five books, including the Sword and the Stone. Um, I was, uh, I, I was gobsmacked by the humor, the adventure, the sexiness of it, the philosophy, the, um, the thoughtfulness and the great compassion that the author had. Many years later, it was actually my, my, my mother, my second mother, as I say, um, I say it like that because my, my first mother died in childbirth when I was born. So I, had, I was raised by a second mother. And, uh, the uh, many years later, she said, after she read Wicked and it was published, she said, you know, I think that you were greatly influenced by the Once and Future King. And I said to myself, holy mother of God, you're right. What did I do but take a story that everybody already knew and try to tell it again as if they'd never heard it before. And I had to have enormous hubris to do that. And I was really afraid of being shot down uh, by by critics like how dare you how dare you throw your own 
loop around the neck of our mm -hmm. sacred cow, the Wizard of Oz is one of our American foundation myths. You have no, you have no right, young man. <laughs> um, uh, but I did it anyway. And I think I did it because T.H. White poured his whole heart and soul and his considerable intellect into retelling Arthur as if nobody knew that who Wart was or who Merlin was. He presented them all over again. The freshness, the bravado, the challenge of doing that. I think my, my second mother was right. That's, that was my model. So in a way that was probably one of the most important books. I loved Harriet the Spy. I loved A Wrinkle in Time. I loved The Diamond in the Window. Uh, many, many other uh, children's fantasies. But I think The Once and Future King showed me you could be a good writer and take something that had be that already belonged to the world and play with it and give it back to them. And maybe make them glad to, to see it again. You mentioned several works that have been adapted in several ways, including on screen. Um, earlier, you referenced the line in The Hobbit, and obviously Tolkien has right. been made into so many movies at this point. <laughs> right. um, we had one person write in with a question um, about a movie movie coming from your book. They said, I recently read Wicked all the way through for the first time and really enjoyed it. But of course, there were some changes to adapt it to musical form. And now with this new movie, they're wondering, are you involved at all with the upcoming film? And if so, can you tell us if it will accurately portray the themes of the book or is it going to be Disney-fied? I like that word. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is a good word. I, I, could, I will say that there are many, many things that I admire about the play. In fact, almost everything I admire about the play. I'm not just, I'm a polite guy, but I'm not just being polite. I really do think mm -hmm. the, um, the composer and, and all the people who worked on the, the creative team took this great, slightly sour uh, pottage of a big fat book and said, what, what can we use here that will communicate the most important things that Gregory Maguire wants to say, but make them easier to listen to by a larger audience and will work in a, in a dramatic situation. I think they did a great job and I don't dispute anything, even the changes they made to the ending, which did give me, cause me to, have a drop in my blood pressure the first time I heard about it, but I, I survived. Uh, so the movie is coming along now, 20 years after the play has been written. It's, almost, it's, it's been on Broadway, it'll be its 19th year um, in about four months. So it'll be 20 years before um, the movie comes out. And I have elected uh, thanks to the contract that I wrote myself or that I accepted myself and declared the terms of myself, I've elected to serve as a grandfather rather than a father. I mean, too, too many fathers can really, uh, you know, screw up a baby and too many <laughs> mothers can too. So I'm taking an avuncular, you know, affectionate position in the rocking chair at the back of the room and I, I stroke my chin and I say, very well done, my children, you know, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what they're going to do to the um, to the movie. It is certainly going to be based on the play. But uh, you, Jeremy, you may have heard this, or maybe your um, your listeners have heard this. Recently, it has been released this news that the director and producers intend to make it into a two part uh, film. Um, experience that is like Harry Potter part one, Harry Potter mm -hmm. part two for the Deathly Hallows. There'll be Wicked part one, a movie, and a year later, there'll be Wicked part two or six months later, whatever they expect to do. Um, so in, they want to do that because they already had to cram a lot of my book into a two and a half hour play. And a movie is generally even shorter than a two and a half hour play. They decided instead of jeopardizing what they already had and they really worked hard, um, to squeeze it all in. They wanted to open it up a little bit. And I do, I have heard that they have gone back to the book and they are going to, the, the composer and the writer have reread it and have uh, tried to think of things that they decided they couldn't use first time round, but that they still had a, an affection for. But what those things are, I don't know. And I probably won't know until it comes to a cineplex near me. And, you know, are you are you excited to see it? Like, will you be there opening night? Oh, I'm sure I'll be there opening night. In fact, there's, they're supposed to start filming in London at the end of um, the year or the very beginning of next year. And I will certainly go for, 
for part of the filming. Um, and I am excited to see it, but I also, uh, I also live in a, you know, I live on the moon. I live in the sea of tranquility. You know, if it doesn't happen, well, it's been nice to think about. If I don't like it, well, it's been nice to think that I might like it. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't do well, oh well. You know, I've I've been frugal and uh, I've had I've had a wonderful ride out of uh, Wicked and my downstream career for the last uh, thirty years, and uh, that's great. So, but I I expect I'll like it. I'm I'm a I, I tend to be enthusiastic, so I think I'll probably like it. We're going to take a quick break here, but don't go anywhere because we're going to be back in just a couple minutes. And we're going to turn now to my colleague, Jamie Reese, who is joining us to share a special offer with everyone. Hi, everyone. Here I am. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight during this very special installment of Beyond the Page, featuring the wickedly inventive and talented writer Gregory Maguire. You know, the great thing about books and GBH is both are commercial free. We bring people together through entertaining stories and events like this one. We serve you and not advertisers. If you feel GBH makes a difference in your life, then please consider giving now. Tonight, if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer, that's just $60 a year, we will send you a signed copy of Gregory Maguire's latest novel, Cress Watercress. Now, whether you're reading this book aloud or alone, you know, this beautifully illustrated animal tale of family and friendship is sure to be a hit with readers of all ages. It might even be a classic someday. So giving is simple and secure, and there are three ways to give tonight. Option number one, you can visit gbh.org slash support events. Option number two, you can send a text to 800 2043811 and then use the keyword GBH to donate. Or you can scan the QR code pictured behind me right here and a donation form will magically appear on your smartphone or smart device. Now there will never be a better time to give than now. Donate to GBH and we will send you, like I said, a signed copy of Cress Watercress. You know, out of all the news and entertainment sources out there, you know, you turn to GBH, and that's why we're turning to you for your support. Happy reading, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of tonight's event with Gregory McGuire and Jeremy Siegel. Thanks so much, Jamie. And now it's time to continue our discussion with Gregory McGuire. And as a reminder, keep adding your questions into the Q&A tab. We're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. And we've had some great ones come in. There are two here that actually pair really nicely with each other. One is from Anne and the other is from Olivia. I'll start with Olivia's. She asks, are there any other stories or fairy tales you think you could retell? Well, that is a good question. And I, I don't, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a pickpocket. I, I don't go into the <laughs> library, uh, intending to, to walk off with somebody else's ideas. What I do generally is have a burning question and then if, or a concern or even a, a hypothesis, and then ask myself the question, is there something that we share culturally that could be a proper setting for this question. Um, I'll give you an example. In my book, Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister, I didn't start out thinking, oh, I had such a great success with Wicked, now let me try to retell Cinderella. No, I started out by, ha by having a, a kind of philosophical question about how we feel compelled to 
authenticate what we consider to be beautiful and what we deem has less value. That is, how do we ascertain relative values of beauty? And if let's talk about the apples and oranges, which tastes better, you know, an apple or an orange. This is a question that we struggle with all the time. And I began to think, well, what is the most beautiful thing? Is the, is the beauty of a young person at the peak of physical perfection, which you know, some would say is somewhere between 14 and 18, um, is that the most beautiful thing that, that, we, that we can experience in human life? Is a night sky with stars and a shooting star the most beautiful thing? Is a painting that has lasted 450 years that comes to us from a, a master like you know Vermeer, is that the most beautiful thing? Not 450 years for Vermeer, but you get the picture. Uh, and, and this is the kind of question that we ask ourselves and we know there's no answer, but we can't, we can't help, I can't help thinking about it. So I began to think, well, what do we know about beauty? What are our stories about beauty in this world that we live in? And one of them is about Cinderella and the fact that she became so beautiful thanks to the fairy godmother that her relatives couldn't even recognize her. And I began to think, well, there's something there. So I will turn over the stones of this story and I will try to figure out how I can make this story serve my purpose about presenting to readers this question about what is the most beautiful thing. In the, in the business of writing that book, I discovered what I think is the most beautiful thing in human experience. But I'll leave that for readers to go read the book and see if they can figure it out for themselves. So the similar question I mentioned is from Anne, um, who asks, are there any characters you would like to resurrect and deconstruct, but can't for whatever reason? <laughs> that is a, oh yeah. Well, probably I'm not even allowed to name them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, um, there are certain characters who are still under copyright protection. Uh, and uh, going back just a second, when I wrote about the Wicked Witch of the West, mm -hmm. when I was 38 or so, uh, I did not realize uh, what copyright protection actually meant. And so I wrote the book and I sent it to my agent in New York and he said, oh, you are so smart. I said, well, yes, everybody knows that. <laughs> why, why precisely are you telling me that now? And he said, the estate of L. Frank Baum came out of copyright four months ago. And I oh said, my, wow. Oh my hell, I've been working on this book and thinking about it for three years. I didn't know it was in copyright. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it had lapsed, you know, decades earlier. That's but incredible. 72 years, I think, or 75 years or 70 after the death of the writer. And the writer died in 1919, I think. And uh, here I was with a manuscript ready to send to a publisher. And uh, he said, you really, I think I think I have a fairy godmother. <laughs> gives me gives me ideas when I can use them. Now, Jeremy, before you go on, I do want to, because I I, I believe in the work that uh, you're doing at GBH, and I believe that everybody should get a signed book uh, uh, if you make a donation. I I do want to point out to you. I, I have bookmarked Crest Watercrest, and the artwork is so important to this book. It was part of what began it and is part of what makes, I think, the book moving. So I have put bookmarks in um, the, uh, the two pages oh, wow. to show you. Aren't they cute? Little crest, water crest bookmarks with their rabbit ears. And the, the illustrator is a British fellow named David Litchfield. And when I think you used the, the phrase, uh, or maybe it was uh, Elizabeth, a classic novel, there are some pages in this book, I know there's a little glare on this page. There's Cress at the bottom, and there's uh, she's dealing with a bear in the middle of the night. Huge bear. There are pages that I would love to have a three foot by five foot blow ups of, and have them, you know, hanging around my house. They're so, so spectacular. Um, here's the bear again later on in the story. Um, just. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how this artist did this artwork, but there are full color pictures about every four pages through a 240 page book. That's very rare. 
and uh, it's, an, it's an expensive book to produce. And if you've noticed, it's actually heavy to pick up. It's heavier than a book its size. It was printed on really fine Italian paper so that the colors wouldn't bleed through. So it's, it is a real work of art. Even if you didn't like the story, it's a real work of art because David Litchfield has done a magnificent job like, like taking um, the stained glass windows out of a, out of a decommissioned, uh, you know, 19th century Romanesque revival church and putting them in the Cuisinart and just pressing pulse about four times. The picture is just low. And uh, so I, I, it, it wouldn't be fair for me to be talking about Cress even one sentence more without saying that I was teamed up with a brilliant artist. Who, and if this book turns out to be the classic that some people say it might do, it's going to be as much because he did, he has done really brilliant work. So I, I want your, I want your listeners to uh, go find it at the library, go find it in your local bookstores, contribute to GBH and get a signed copy. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that because the illustrations really are beautiful. I remember coming up on that one of the bear and thinking, cause you imagine it, but then you see it. And I remember thinking that bear is way bigger than I imagined. <laughs> way, way bigger. And that, that little crest water crest did not fall over and die of a heart attack. <laughs> and that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> so we had one uh, viewer who wrote in, what are you working on now that crest is out in the world? Also, how do you decide if you want to write a book for adults or for kids? So let's first start out with um, what you're working on now, and then we'll get to adults versus kids. Okay. Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, like like everybody else, I uh, became anxious. You know, I had my my own little package of fears that I had reserved from childhood that I can take out and and um, sip like those candies that you get through a straw <laughs> whenever I need to be more scared. You know, I take one out and I I uh, I wondered what was going to happen to all of us in the next two years, and I knew for my own mental health, if nothing else, if if not for my ability to contribute to bill paying, uh, that I needed to put a book uh, in the in the computer and, and get it going. So I sold Harper. I'm leaning to grab something. I sold my adult publisher, Harper Collins, on a three book series called Another Day, which is a downstream series of the Wicked Years of Wicked. The first book is called The Brides of the Brides of Maricor, and you can see there that the uh, the character is a green skinned young girl. It's not Elphaba, the Wicked Witch of the West. It's her granddaughter. And so this is, you know, like I'm not I'm not building the Marvel universe, but this child had already existed in in my previous books. And so I've been writing, uh, I've been writing the three books. The second one is not out yet, but it's called the uh, the Oracle of Maricor. And there she is again, with a couple of harpies flying around. And I've, I'm working. I worked this afternoon on the third book called The Witch of Maricor. So that will probably be done in another month or so. And after that, what, how will I decide to write for adults or for children mm -hmm. again? Yeah. That's a good question. And generally speaking, if the idea is important enough, it belongs to children. Because it, there, there's only a certain amount of time we have in life to read as children. We don't, I believe, most of us read as deeply and with as much affection and with as much sponge capacity in our brains and in our spirits and hearts as children read. That time is very limited. And so to me, it's important that children get the best. And if I have better material, if I have a stronger impulse, then I try to write something for children um, because they're a richer audience and they, and they deserve it. Adults can read something and forget about, I, I read, forget things that I read two weeks ago. But if a child loves something, it's with them forever. That's a really important uh, thing to remember for me as a writer. We began this conversation by talking about fear. And you also just mentioned the little morsels of fear coming <laughs> up during the pandemic. Right. Olivia wrote in with a follow-up question of sorts saying, what, um, or sorry, was it sort of intentional to focus on different types of fear that children could experience in the book, such as moving to a different home or losing a parent, et cetera? Were, were you thinking about it sort of in like, you know, focusing in your writing on those different blocks of fear? Well, uh, was this Olivia who asked this? Did you mm -hmm. say? Yeah, well, Olivia, that's a, that's a really good question too. And I, I think what I would say is that 
once I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a clumsy analogy that many people have used before about telling a story being like getting in a motor vehicle and driving from coast to coast. You may have a general idea where you want to end up. You know, you know, you want to end up in. You leave Boston, you, know, you want to end up in San Francisco rather than in Spokane, Washington. Let's say. Um, or maybe Spokane you want to end up in. You have a general idea, but you don't know the trajectory you're going to take. And so part of the part of the fun of writing is to find out what what your path shows you along the way as you go from the first page to the last page of a book. The other thing that I have learned is that what sort of, and here's I'm extending the analogy in a tiresome way, what sort of gas you put in your vehicle at the beginning will help your whole operation run. So uh, Olivia, I did not make a list of fears and say, how many of these can I cover in 240 pages? No, I put the gas in the, in the idea of the story that this is gonna be about a child with a vital emotional life. And then I was just gonna you know, drive my car following that rabbit down the highway as she went from ghost to ghost. I was going to, I was gonna let my subconscious determine what fears the story seemed to suggest were important. I, in other words, I don't overanalyze, but I trust, I've really learned to trust my instincts. You know, um, one of my great muses and a dear friend for many years was the uh, picture book artist and writer Maurice Sendak. And uh, I interviewed him a number of times on the stage and we were personal friends on the phone and, and visiting as well. And he used to talk a lot about sinking the bucket. That is, he had learned round about the time of doing Where the Wild Things Are, he had learned to rely on the impulses of his subconscious. And he had learned not to second guess himself and paralyze himself with analysis too much. And I listened to him say this over and over again. And I think one of the benefits of growing older is that you learn to trust your capacity to sink the bucket and you learn to trust your capacity that whatever it brings up, you can work with it. If it wasn't valuable, it wouldn't be there. And it's there in your subconscious, it's there in your life history, and it's coming up now because it's, there's something active and vital. It's, a, uh, it's an active yeast and it will work. You spoke a bit about your writing process there. Um, Zara asked if you could speak more about your writing process and how it's changed over the years or has it changed? The one thing that hasn't changed, Sarah, is that because I taught myself to write stories when I was really kind of five, six, eight, I started writing stories regularly by the time I was eight, you know, and I, and I have many of them still. Uh, I only knew one way to do it, which was to get a good first sentence and then see where it went, see where it drove, see where the vehicle drove. I, I admire people who can write passages and then shuffle them and can take you know, the old fashioned version of the of the scissors like Proust, I think, used to cut up his manuscripts and use pots of glue and tape. And then his poor uh, amanuensis had to retype them over and over again. And he would change his mind. We now can do that on the computer. I could never do that. I'd start. I don't start until I have a first sentence that is going to push me toward a second. And I don't stop writing and I don't go back and rewrite until I reach the last page. Uh, now, when I do reach the last page. I do go back and you know I, I let I let it sit in its own juices for a couple of weeks and I go back and read it and wherever I feel like I want to vomit I make a little mark in the side of the page <laughs> and say you got to work on on this this bit buddy um, but I still it's a very simple way of proceeding uh, it's just in a hole in the ground there lived a rabbit you know sort of and then what happened to her and I I just follow her if I feel the rabbit might get be getting bored by having to stay underground um, with her mother and her baby brother, then I'm bored too. I want I want the rabbit I want the rabbit to disobey her mother and get out. And so I just she gets out and I follow her <laughs> with my notebook and <laughs> write down what she's doing. Very <laughs> that's hard. fascinating. Very so hard. through the years, has that process changed or going back to books like Wicked that people read a while ago? You wrote that going straight from beginning I to wrote, finish before? I wrote that going straight forward, but I, I will admit that I tried to start Wicked once or twice before I got an active start. You know, um, I, I, I once I wrote one and a half pages, another time I wrote about 15 pages, and each time the tone was wrong and there was something, 
supercilious about it and uh, I didn't like it and it didn't take it. It's like the yeast was flat. It didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't keep bubbling. So I had to throw it down the sink and I said, well, I'll try again another year. And for Wicked, it, I tried like three times before it took. Um, when, when I was asked how my writing has changed, I'm much more clever now about recognizing just by the smell of an idea, whether it's active yeast. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't waste too much time and I don't start for the yeast is ready to be put in the, in the tepid water of 130 degrees. <laughs> we have another process question here. Um, I love this one from Maria who asks, are you able to read a book as you're writing or would that distract you during your process? Again, Maria, that's a, another good question. I tend to I tend to read while I'm writing, but I tend to try not to not read things that might in any way uh, sort of seem to be to be living on the same shelf as my book. So I read I read more nonfiction as I get older. Uh, and if I read fiction, I'll read from fiction from a different country. Or if I'm writing a children's book, I won't read children's books while I'm, you know, while I'm writing a children's book. Uh, but I can't go to sleep without reading. So if I didn't keep reading while I was writing, then I would die and then my story would never get done. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have one person who wrote in um, about how excited they are for this to attend this webinar. And they ask, what advice do you have uh, to give to young aspiring writers? Well, I've mentioned twice, I think, that the wonderful book called Harriet the Spy, which is not as popular as it was when I was a kid, but when I was a kid, it taught me and many, many other writers my age how to be a writer. Um, one, of, one of my friends is Alison Bechdel, you know, of the Bechdel test, Fun mm -hmm. Home and all that. And she and I were once on a panel together and we both kind of fell into each other's arms over our, over our mutual devotion for Harriet the Spy. Harriet the Spy turned her into a writer and it turned me into a writer too. So anybody who doesn't know this because it's now getting to be a little bit um, older and not as popular as it was, should go and find it. Uh, what Harriet does in that book is what I did as a young person and what most people who are going to be artists do too, which is she spends a little bit of time every day with a pencil in her hand. She doesn't care about the product, what she writes is not even particularly good. Sometimes it's funny, but sometimes it's funny accidentally, funny to a child reader, not necessarily to herself. But what she does do is stick herself to her task of paying attention to the mystery, the complexity, and the, the, the irritating unanswerability of the world. That's why writers write, that's why artists paint and that's why musicians play because they're trying to unlock something about the obscure nature of our experience here on earth. Harriet does too and so to a young writer I would say write something every day. It's like if you want to be a pianist you have to do your scales every day. You don't have to do them for an hour you know you're not you're not going to get to Carnegie Hall but if you want your fingers to stay limber do them five minutes a day. If you want to you know, improve in French, read French for 10 minutes a day. You know, it'll get better. It'll take forever, but it'll get better. Write a little bit every day and don't be too hard on yourself about product. At starting out, it's process. It's process all the way. Product will take care of itself when instinct becomes habit and habit becomes talent. But harness the instinct first. We have uh, a very specific question here about Cress. Um, one viewer wrote, why does Cress have a little sibling? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. He just seemed to be there. I mean, they, could, they couldn't very well leave him behind when they moved out of their, their private warrant. Now, um, she has a little sibling, I suppose, and I can answer this question now once the book was finished. I couldn't have answered it ahead of time. I think she has a little sibling because she is the proud guarantor of the memory of life with her father and her little sibling is too young to have that memory. And so one of the reasons he's there is to give her the impulse to live in her memories and not turn them away and not fail to cherish what has happened to her, even if it means accepting that times are hard and he may never come back. 
Um, Mary Beth wrote in to ask, how did or didn't the pandemic influence your writing process? Well, I, I I wish this were like a quorum of you know eighty writers. You could have a question <laughs> yeah. to everybody because I can only speak about myself. I basically worked pretty much the way I always do, but since I'm always writing for um, for my own mental health, it means that it must mean that I've always been a terrible state my whole life. Uh, but uh, I I I pretty much as long as I had something to do, it stabilized me you know, to especially to go back to the, the world of Oz, as it were, as I say, the, the new books um, are like, uh, they're like Frasier is to Cheers, you know, they're, they're spinoff, they have a lot of the same characters, but they operate in their own, in their own um, time as well. Uh, I think what it did is it gave me, it gave me something to look out outside my window that was not people being frightened of death and people being frightened of losing their jobs and people being frightened of infecting their relatives or not being able to visit the elderly when they were about to die. I didn't, I, 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 I paid attention to that in my waking life, but I needed an alternative. A lot of people went to Netflix. <laughs> I, I, went, I went to my computer and started um, to write harder than ever. Mm. Um, my last question here is a big one, and I'm sadly going to have to ask you to answer it in a, about a minute that we have left here. Um, one person wrote in to ask what you believe is the impact or the point or the reasoning for writers retelling or recreating famous stories and fairy tales like you have. Okay, Jeremy, I already warned you that I, I speak in sentences. <laughs> but this is actually this, this is actually one I know the answer of, so you're in luck. The reason to take an old story and to play with it and to give it back to the world from which you got it is in order not to leave out anybody in the room. By which I mean, we all know about silos and bubbles. We all know about the differences in educational experience. And we all know that we are much more divided than is good for us. To take an older story that is already part of the culture and to work with it is to be able to give it back to everybody, not just to the people who vote like you or pray like you or don't vote like you or don't pray like you or you know, don't live in your neighborhood. If you, you know, the childhood belongs to all of us. It, it, childhood isn't a red state or a blue, blue state phenomenon. Childhood is where we come from. It's one of the few universal languages we still have. So to take a childhood story and work with it is to say, I'm not writing this just for people that I would necessarily invite to a dinner party. I'm writing this to anybody who cares about it. And I hope you do. Well, thank you so much for joining all of us um, and, and talking about your work. And we really look forward to reading the next pieces you have coming out. Thank you all so much for tuning into this evening's Beyond the Page. And thank you, Gregory, again, for this incredible conversation. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. It's been a real honor to have you um, on the other side of the screen. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Have a great night. And we hope you all had an amazing evening watching this. And stay tuned to hear who's the next author that we'll be having on next month. Thank you all again for joining us and good night, everyone. Bye-bye.